Okay, welcome back. Our second speaker will tell us about uh, the complex uh, Brun Minkowski theory and positivity of vector bundles from uh, Gothenburg, Sweden, Professor Bo Bernson. Thank you very much. Thanks for the perfect pronunciation of my name. It was actually very good. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak here. Let's see if I can make. Uh, maybe this should be a little bit bigger. <laughs> uh, do I control that? Uh, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Okay, so I gave you the simplified version of the title here. So let me try to explain what this is about then. No. So. I pressed all the buttons here now. Uh. Ah, now. Okay. So let me start by giving the first version of uh, the classical Brun Minkowski theorem. Uh, it says as follows, uh, says the following. Ah, oh, okay, I should. Yeah, okay, I should do it. So I'll start by giving you the first version of the classical Brun Minkowski theorem. And it's given up there. So we start with two convex bodies. They are called A0 and A1. And they are convex bodies in Rn. And then we take a parameter t that lies between 0 and 1. And we sort of interpolate between those two convex bodies by forming a convex combination of the two original bodies there. So that's defined in terms of the Minkowski sum of the two bodies in the following way. So you take the sum of all t times a1 plus 1 minus t times a0, where a1 and a0 lie in the, in the corresponding bodies. Then the theorem says that the volumes, which I denote by absolute values there, they satisfy this inequality. So you take the volume, you raise it to the power 1 over n, and then it satisfies something like a triangle inequality. But you should notice that it's a triangle inequality that goes in the wrong direction, so to speak. So that's sort of characteristic for the whole uh, subject that all inequalities go in the wrong direction somehow. So another way to state this theorem is to say that you look at the volume of a t raised to the power 1 over n as a function of t, and then it's a concave function of t. So that's the first version of the theorem. If you want to, you could also imagine that, well, let's forget about that. So that's the first version. There is another version, there's another way of stating the same theorem which is as follows. So that's the second Brun-Minkowski thing, but yeah. Not really. Uh, now, okay. So instead of looking at uh, Minkowski's sums of convex bodies, we look at one convex body in one dimension higher in Rn plus one. So this new convex body is beautiful A there. And then we let AT be the vertical slices of this convex body in one dimension higher. So it's defined over there. You fix the first variable in Rn plus one, you're left with n variables, and then those n variables should, yeah, the whole thing together should lie in A. So you look at the vertical slices of the convex body. And then the conclusion is essentially the same. Uh, the volume of AT satisfies a, a concavity property. You might also notice that I sneaked in a logarithm instead of the volume raised to the power 1 over n, but that's actually not a big deal here. Uh, if you know this for the logarithm, you also know it for 1 over n to the power 1 over n if you couple it with the homogeneity properties of the Lebesgue measure. So the logarithm is not so important now, but it will turn out to be uh, useful later. So I, I stick to logarithms from now on. But, uh, yeah, this is the statement. So the main thing is that you replace the Minkowski sum by vertical sections of a convex body. And uh, then those two statements are equivalent in the sloppy mathematical way of speaking, which means that it's fairly easy to go from one to the other, much easier than proving either of them. But they are different still. So uh, you, you notice that the first one, involves the notion of addition. You can add the, the points in convex bodies to each other. The second one does not, but it involves the notion of convexity. 
So this means, well, what does it mean? It means, for instance, that if you want to try to generalize the theorem to uh, some other situation, and if you look at the first version of the theorem, then you let you think about uh, situations where you have a notion of addition, maybe some group or something. Say lattice points in Rn, you count the number of lattice points instead of looking at volumes. So you look at some other group or something like that. And there is a fairly substantial amount of work in that direction with which I'm not very familiar. So that's not what I'm going to talk about. The second one does not involve any notion of addition. It just involves that you know uh, when something is, uh, well, there is a notion of convexity. And Hormander has actually written an entire book with that title, Notions of Convexity. So you realize that if you want to generalize it, there are many different choices here, you know, many notions of convexity that you can choose up. And the one I'm going to choose is that uh, it's the notion of convexity that appears in several complex variables, so say in complex geometry, which means that we're going to replace convex functions by plurisubharmonic functions, and uh, we're going to re replace convex bodies by pseudo-convex domains in CN or in, uh, by pseudo-convex manifolds more generally. So that's what we're going to look at. So what does this mean? Uh, first, before I do that, I'm going to state yet another version, which is actually a generalization of the Brun-Minkowski theorem for functions instead of domains. And it is the following statement. It's called Prekopa's theorem because it was first proved by Prekopa, Hungarian mathematician. It goes back to the 50s or 60s or something, I don't remember exactly. So, I don't know what. <laughs> It's only one way to push a button, no? but still, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So instead of a convex body in Rn plus 1, I take a convex function in Rn plus 1. I call that phi, so it depends on t, which is one real variable, and x, which lies in Rn. And then I take e to the minus phi, and I integrate away the x variables. So I get the number, I take the logarithm of that number, I throw in a minus sign, and that defines a new function that will now depend on t. So that's phi tilde of t. And another more suggestive way of writing the same thing is on the second line there. You just take the exponential of both sides, you get that e to the minus phi tilde is equal to this. So uh, if you think of, uh, sorry, if you think of uh, e to the minus phi times d lambda as a mass distribution, uh, then e to minus phi tilde will be the density of another mass distribution. And this is called the marginal of the, organ, uh, or the original mass distribution. It's a common notion in probability. And such mass distributions that have this particular form there, e to the minus something convex, multiplied by Lebesgue measure, they are called log concave. So this theorem says that the marginals of a log concave mass distribution is still log concave. So that's the theorem. Okay, so a few comments on that. First, I give you the formula for phi tilde again. And uh, uh, the first one is that uh, Prekopa's theorem actually, uh, have I talked for 35 minutes or no? Not really. I'm looking at the, at the clock over there. That's it. Uh, uh, Ah, it's time left. Okay, okay, that's better. Okay, so the fact that the fact that phi tilde is convex, it implies the second version of Brun Minkowski. And the link between them is that you choose you take a convex body, you choose your phi to be zero when you're inside the convex body, and uh, infinity when you're outside. So that actually counts uh, for a convex function if you want to. And then uh, it's easy to see that this integral here would be the volume of the vertical slices of the body, and then the theorem is exactly the same. So this is a generalization, but you have uh, much more liberty because you have replaced a convex body by a convex function. Uh, and the second important point to make is that this is not so simple. It's not an easy consequence of Hölder. That's maybe the first thing you will think about. I can prove this just by using Hölder's inequality and the definition of convexity. But if you try to do that, you will find that you will need uh, a version of Hölder that goes in the other direction, in the wrong direction. 
Uh, so that's not true, so you cannot prove it in this way. Uh, on the other hand, you can prove it in a lot of different ways. Uh, I leave aside the original proof of Prekopa, which I think was a reduction to the case of sets, but instead uh, uh, focus on the one by Braskamp and Lieb in the 70s. So they were using an L2 estimate for this equation, the equation du equal to f. And actually it's funny to point out that the main case of the theorem is actually when n is equal to 1. And then this equation here is actually the equation u prime is equal to f, which is probably the simplest differential equation that you can imagine. So it's sort of interesting and also maybe worth noting that you can say something interesting about very simple objects. You apply the machinery of energy estimates for differential equations, you apply it to u prime equal to f, and you come up with the Braskem leave inequality. And this is the key, one key to proving the theorem of that. Now, uh, one point I want to make here is that the Braskem leave inequality can be seen as the real variable version of Hermander's L2 estimate for the d bar equation. Uh, so, um, what I'm doing sort of will correspond to uh, replacing Braskamp Lieb by Hermander's estimate for d bar equations and then see what sort of geometric statements I can get from that. And uh, the third thing here, well, it's actually the fourth, counting zero, is that uh, if you have to say that phi tilde is, is a convex function, it means some sort of inequality, a lot of inequalities actually. Say that you have equality in those. So that means that phi tilde is not just convex, but it's actually linear. Well then, phi has to be of a very special form. It has to have the, this form. You, you start with one function, the other phi, the, 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 the capital phi, and it's defined on Rn, and you make a function in, on Rn plus one just by moving it in some direction. So you, you translate it in some direction. That's essentially all you can do except that you can also add uh, a linear term AT there. So that's uh, a bit important, but I'm not sure I will have, to, have the time to get to the complex analog of that. So let's now move to the complex analogs then of those theorem. So complex versions, we replace the convex functions by plurisubharmonic functions. A convex function Rn is a function that is convex on any real line. And the plurisubharmonic function is a function which is subharmonic on any complex line in CN. And, and uh, second thing, we replace the convex domains by pseudo-convex domains. So th these are domains that have a, pseudo, a plurisubharmonic exhaustion function. So that means that there should exist a plurisubharmonic function in the domain that goes to infinity when you approach the domain. Uh, and, and that's a notion that uh, includes the convex domains, but it's much more general. So for instance, in uh, one complex variable, any domain is uh, pseudo-convex. Any domain in R is actually convex also, you should think about it, because it's an interval. Uh, now, uh, we introduce the main enemy here, which is uh, Sisselmann's example of a pure subharmonic function. So I give it, no, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I have it there, yes. So there are two different ways of writing it. The second way of writing it there it shows that it's plurisubharmonic because it starts with a mod C square, which is uh, actually convex, and uh, so it's plurisubharmonic. And then you subtract something which is the real part of a holomorphic function, and therefore it's uh, actually harmonic on any complex line. So this is definitely plurisubharmonic. But you can use the first formula to compute the corresponding phi tilde and you quickly find that it's equal to minus tau squared modulus of tau squared plus a constant. And it's not plurisubharmonic, it's exactly the opposite. So uh, the naive uh, generalization of Prekopas theorem to complex situations fails, does not work. So we have to fix it. So uh, this is how we fix it. I think, no, there is no fix. 
Hmm? Ah, okay, so instead of looking at this thing, yes, the integral of e to the minus phi, you uh, multiply by mod of h squared, where h is a holomorphic function. So, you, so you get some weighted L2 norm of holomorphic functions. It's over there. You can think of the analog. You can think that in front, up, up here, in the real setting, you have an, um, uh, an invisible uh, one squared, which means that you have a, a, the norm of a constant. So instead of looking at the constants, as in the real setting, which lie in the kernel of the D operator, you look at something that lies in the kernel of the D bar operator. Uh, we can do it a little bit more generally by uh, having not just a function, but we have also a domain. So we take a pseudo-convex domain in CN plus one. We look at the slices, just as we did in the real case. And then we have a pluris harmonic weight. So for each uh, value of tau now, of the first variable, so tau lies in C, uh, we get a space of holomorphic functions. The space of holomorphic functions on the slice that are square integrable against the weight function, like this. So that is uh, what's called the Bergman space of analytic functions, holomorphic functions. Uh, and now, this is not so well written, we get a, a sort of bundle of Hilbert spaces. For each tau, we have a Hilbert space that I call E tau, which is just the Bergman space. And uh, then uh, as tau varies, we get a bundle of spaces. It's not properly speaking a vector bundle. Uh, uh, it's, not properly, it's not properly speaking a vector bundle. You can turn it like this. No? Uh, it, I'll try to stay here. Sorry, uh, but it's um, intuitively, you can think of it as a vector bundle. It's not formally a vector bundle because it's not locally trivial. Now, the first version of the complex Prekopa theorem says that this bundle of, of Hilbert spaces has positive curvature. So what does that mean and what's the relation to Prekopa? Well, if you... Imagine that it were a real vector, an honest vector bundle, and moreover of finite rank, then you could think of the norms as given by some sort of a matrix valued function. And then there is a formula for the curvature operator, which is this one, and says that uh, this expression should be positive. And uh, intuitively speaking, that would say that minus the logarithm of H would be subharmonic which is then uh, like in the, in the Prekopa situation, minus the logarithm of something defined by integrals is subharmonic. But of course, this is not really a precise statement. Uh, so in order to get a precise statement, I will, uh, it's more precise. It has the advantage of being true uh, as, as opposed to this, um, but it's more uh, hard to digest perhaps, but I will just give you the, the theorem here. So let's imagine that we have a family of measures on the fibers. So on each, on each uh, slice, d tau, we have a measure mu tau we with compact support, say, with the property that if you integrate a uh, holomorphic function, now it's holomorphic with respect to both the tau and the c there, you get a function of tau and you require this to be holomorphic function of tau always. Then. Uh, the, the statement is that uh, mine, well, the logarithm of the norm of this measure must be subharmonic. But now the norm here means the norm as a functional on uh, the Hilbert space, on the Bergman space. So if you're familiar with vector bundles, honest vector bundles, uh, the mu tau should be thought of as a holomorphic section of the dual bundle. And this then says that the logarithm of the norm of any section of the dual bundle is subharmonic, which says that the dual bundle is negative, which says that the original bundle is positively curved. But this statement has the advantage that it works even if it's only a fake vector bundle and not a real vector bundle. So, so this is my substitute for this. 
So that's the first version. I called it uh, theorem A then, the first version of complex Prekova. And here's a consequence directly. You can take the measures there to be the point masses at various points that, that move in a holomorphic way. And then you get uh, rather quickly that if you look at the Bergman kernel for each of the slices there, uh, they will depend on the base variable tau. And then you have Bergman kernel, uh, the C is the fiber variable. And uh, this uh, function logarithm of the Bergman kernel is plurisubharmonic. It depends in a plurisubharmonic way on all the variables. In particular, it's subharmonic with respect to the tau variable. So this is a generalization of a rather old theorem of Maitani and Yamaguchi, who had proved this when the dimension of the space is uh, one and there is no weight function. Uh, and you can also, I will just say this in words, that if you look at the special situation when phi and the domain does not depend on the imaginary part of tau, then you have something that's defined really by uh, real objects, and then you uh, apply this statement here, the theorem A, and then you will get back the Prekopa theorem. So th this really, it contains Prekopa theorem. And if you want to be, uh, well, bragging, you could say that classical real variable Bruno-Minkowski is a, a uh, set of complex Bruno-Minkowski when you have some extra symmetry, in this case, a toric symmetry. And another way to make the comparison with Bruno-Minkowski is to note that if you have a domain in Rn, say a convex domain, it doesn't need to be, and you look at the function one, the constant function one over the volume of A, you can view this as an integral operator, and then it's the Bergman, it's a Bergman kernel for the constants. And uh, then Bruno Minkowski says that this moves in a, in a convex way, whereas this says that the general Bergman kernels moves in, move in a subharmonic way. So that's one uh, way of looking at things. Now, a more general picture is the following. So you, we replace uh, the linear sections of domains in CN by holomorphic manifolds. When you are in the convex world, like in Brun Minkowski and Prekop and so on, then you, uh, you, you think of linear sections. But in the holomorphic uh, situation, you would think of holomorphic sections. So we have just, uh, sorry, we have just uh, uh, the situation now that we have a complex manifold X and another complex manifold Y of lower dimension, and we have a map from X to Y. And we will, under, uh, we will assume that this map P is a proper holomorphic submersion. So submersion will guarantee that the fibers of the map that correspond to the slices before, they are smooth manifolds, and properness will tell you that they are compact manifolds. So they are now compact manifolds. And now we're going to look at holomorphic uh, functions on a, on a compact manifold. It's, it's not so interesting. So we will actually introduce also a line bundle, uh, L over, uh, over X, uh, with a metric E to the minus phi, which will correspond to the plurisubharmonic function that I had before. Now we have to introduce what is the analog of the Bergman space in this situation. So the Bergman space is this. So the important thing is that we are, uh, I'm writing it in this notation there. So HN0 XYL means now the space of holomorphic N forms. So they are not holomorphic functions, they are N forms now with values in L. And then I can use the metric phi to define an L2 norm of such things. I wedge the, uh, an N form with its conjugate. I get an N N form, so that's a volume form. I can integrate it. And the E to the minus phi will uh, make this uh, a, uh, a volume form, even if U happens to be uh, L valued, line bundle value. So the reason I'm looking for uh, at n forms instead of uh, at functions is that if I were looking at functions, then I would need to introduce some measure on the fiber. I don't have any God-given measure. But if I look at n forms instead, I can define L2 norms 
immediately. And now the second version of the theorem is that assume, uh, uh, assume that the total space X is a Kähler manifold. So uh, if you know what that is, it's good. If you don't know it, you can just think of it as a condition that somehow replaces the, the convexity in, uh, in the real Brun Minkowski thing. Then the e, uh, EY here, those sets, uh, those spaces of holomorphic n forms with values in L with this norm, they make up a real, well, an honest uh, bona fide vector bundle. It's really a vector bundle now, and this has positive curvature, and it has positive curvature in the sense of Nakano, if you're an expert in the business, which is the strongest notion of, uh, of positivity of vector bundle. So that's what the theorem says in this case. Then, then you don't need to do, introduce all those measures. You could do, but it's not necessary because now we really have a vector bundle. And an addendum that corresponds to uh, uh, the conditions for equality in Prekopas theorem. I'll just say it very roughly. If phi is uh, strictly plurisubharmonic on each fiber, that's a technical condition which uh, is necessary actually. Well, something like that is necessary. And if you assume that the curvature is not greater than or equal to zero, but actually zero, so that the bundle E is flat, then the situation is actually trivial. So then X is biholomorphic to a product. The vibration is a product. And uh, uh, the line bundle also doesn't move, and the metric on the line bundle does not move. Uh, if you apply a, uh, a flow of a holomorphic vector field, so you may disguise it by you, might, you may take a trivial situation and apply the flow of holomorphic vector field to make it look non-trivial, but uh, after going back, it's actually a trivial situation in that case. And that corresponds precisely to equality in Prekopas theorem, where you uh, uh, ha had a constant vector. You, you were translating a fixed thing in, in, in the direction of a fixed vector. Now you have a holomorphic vector field instead. That's what I said there. Okay, so uh, now we have this, and so uh, what's it, what is it supposed to be good for? So I will give you a few, sometimes you talk about applications, but if you prefer, it's more uh, uh, illustrations maybe. But uh, let's see, so there are a few, a few uh, situations where those things uh, apply here. And uh, some of this I will have to do rather sloppily because it involves a lot of theory, but the first one is pretty simple. So this is uh, in the area of, of classical analysis. You, you start with CN, you take t two complex norms, the zero norm and the one norm. So you have two complex norms on CN, fixed. Now there is a procedure, it's actually a Swedish method called the method of complex interpolation or RIS interpolation that allows you to interpolate between the norms with the, the complex method of interpolation. And then you get intermediate norms, they're called, uh, they are there, and you can look at their uh, unit balls. And you can look at the volume of the unit balls, and then the theorem is, is that the logarithm of, of uh, sorry, the uh, uh, the logarithm of the volumes of the unit ball is a concave function. Of t. So this is a nice statement that, for instance, uh, implies uh, the Santalo inequality for, uh, via an extra argument. So this uh, basically follows from the first Brun Minkowski, uh, the first uh, the complex version of Brun Minkowski, if you verify that the assumptions in that theorem are uh, fulfilled. So that's one uh, application, and I I don't think that this was known before. It was discovered by Dario Cordero Erascan. Okay, so that was uh, in the realm of, of classical analysis, if you want. Or, and, then, and, and then I move quickly to families of complex manifolds. Okay, so now we are looking at a situation when uh, you have X and Y. They are, it's, a family, it's a vibration, it's a proper holomorphic submersion. And our vector bundle had then those fibers here. They are not holomorphic functions, but holomorphic n-forms now. Uh, 
the vector bundle that you get in that uh, setting has been studied a lot in algebraic geometry, and, and it's uh, associated to, it's the vector bundle that's associated to the direct image sheaf. The, the sheaf, look at the sheaf of sections of this thing here. If you don't know what this means, it's not really important here, but uh, you look at the relative canonical bundle, and you twist it with L, you look at the sheaf of sections to that, you take the direct image, you get the sheaf downstairs, and this sheaf happens to be, under my conditions, it's locally free, so it corresponds to a vector bundle. But that's just, uh, so far, just words. So we still have this vector bundle with the fibers up there. Uh, now, if you forget about the L in this situation, then the theorem that I described is actually uh, a known theorem in algebraic geometry. It's due to Fujita and Griffiths. So it follows from Griffith's theory of uh, variation of Hodge structures, that the bundle is positive in that case when there is no L there. So this, uh, the theorem, if you want to, it can be viewed as a twisted version of this theorem, this consequence of variation of Hodge structures. There are other ways to get twisted versions also, but this, as far as I know, is the only way that you get some, some sort of metric positivity. You get really a metric on the bundle and the curvature in the classical sense of metrics on holomorphic vector bundles is actually positive. Now, uh, this has been generalized. I, I'm, I was assuming here that uh, uh, P was a proper submersion. If you just assume that it's proper and a surjective map to uh, very general situation, then uh, the statement here has been generalized by Mihai Kohn and Takayama, uh, and you get a, uh, a corresponding statement in that case for positivity of sheaves. So they introduced the notion of metric positivity of coherent sheaves, and, uh, uh, and they showed that this is related to the notion of weak positivity by Viveg, etc. And this way one recovers some results of Viveg on the weak positivity of direct images of such sheaves there. And actually, uh, maybe, I think, I hope, a somewhat uh, stronger version of those results. So that's the second uh, sort of uh, application. You apply it to the variation of complex manifolds. Uh, a third sort of application is the following. Uh, we look at, uh, uh, and this, is, this is related to what Simon Donaldson spoke about in his lecture this morning. So you look at the space of all metrics on a fixed line bundle over a fixed manifold. So that corresponds to the following situation. Yes, so you take the the total space X uh, to be a product. So it's one fixed compact manifold C, and omega is just an open set in C. So it's a trivial vibration if you want. All the sections uh, are the same. And now you have a vector, uh, sorry, uh, a line bundle over C. It's a holomorphic line bundle, and you pull it back to a bundle over uh, the product here, just by letting it be independent, so to speak, of the omega variable. So uh, the map here P is of course just a map that sends a point in X to uh, the projection in omega. So. Okay. Now we have a, a trivial vibration. So uh, it seems, and, and the line bundle is also the same for any, any point, it, it's just one fixed line bundle on C. So there's not so much that varies but one thing that can vary is the metric on the line bundle. So uh, uh, a metric, now we're looking at uh, metrics on L underlined, so that's a line bundle on X. So a metric on that can be viewed as a curve of metrics on L itself, depending on the omega variable. And therefore, one can use the second theorem here to study variations of such metrics uh, so that is the space, the Mabuchi space, uh, studied by Mabuchi, Sems, and Donaldson, and 
many, many others, uh, or positively curve the metrics on L or on a fixed manifold. You can look at the variations of metrics instead of looking at variations of manifold. So I will not go into any details about that, but uh, I give you a uh, simplest case here, which is uh, not so uninteresting, which is actually quite interesting. So the simplest case is when C is Fano. That's uh, typically not the simplest case of a compact manifold, perhaps, but uh, in this situation, it is the simplest case. Because uh, that C is Fano means that uh, the canonical bundle is negative. So the negative or the canonical bundle is positive, and I can choose it as my L. So I uh, look now at the vector bundle that has those fibers here. Vector bundles over, over one fixed, no, yeah, holom the fibers correspond to n forms on C with values in the inverse of the bundle of n forms. So then you don't get very much. I mean, you have a, uh, it's, a, it's an n form with values in the inverse of the bundle of n forms. So it's just a holomorphic function. And since it's a compact manifold, it's just a constant. So uh, we have constants here. So our vector bundle is a line bundle. It's, uh, uh, the rank is one in every point. And uh, a metric now on uh, the anti-canonical bundle on minus kc, it can be identified with a volume form on the manifold. And therefore, the theorem, the, the second theorem in this case says that, oops, says that uh, if, so e to the minus phi is the metric, and we identify it with a volume form, you can integrate it, and, you, and it says that this uh, thing varies in a subharmonic way with uh, the metric phi. And uh, this way it looks pretty much like the Prekopa theorem. A particular case of this is when phi only depends on the real part of tau. Then the subharmonicity means that it is a convex function. This is a convex function. And then it's even more like Prekopa theorem. So it's sort of a Prekopa theorem for Fano manifolds. So what's that good for? Uh, well, one thing is that uh, I, I used it to uh, give a generalization of the Bandu Mabuchi uniqueness theorem, uh, uniqueness theorem for Keller Einstein metrics. So, this theorem says that if you have a Fano manifold and two uh, Keller Einstein metrics, they are related via the flow of a holomorphic vector field. And this uh, is is connected with the condition for equality that I had in the theorem, which were ultimately the conditions for inequality in Prekopas theorem. There was also a holomorphic vector field that appeared in there. And it has also been used by Chen, Donaldson, and Soon to give a version, a generalization of Matsushima's theorem on the reductivity of the automorphism group which was, first, was the first obstruction known to the existence of keller einstein metric. So in both those cases, the generalization consists in looking at not just keller einstein metrics, but twisted keller einstein metric. but I will not go into that. Now I have like four minutes left. Could that be right? Uh, this, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, oh, yeah, if you believe in it, I believe in it. So, so, uh, uh, so let me just give very quickly a last application. So we've been looking at uh, a situation where we have families of uh, varying complex manifolds. We have looked at a situation where we have a fixed manifold, but uh, a metric on a line bundle that changes. And now, we'll, uh, at the end, we will look at something where we don't have any family at all. At the outset of the problem, uh, nothing varies. So we have a fixed pseudo-convex domain in CN. We uh, say it contains the origin. And we are interested in the Bergman kernel of this uh, domain at the origin. And we want to have an estimate from below of the Bergman kernel. Such estimates are uh, important in many situations. But uh, uh, the one I have in mind here is called the Suita conjecture because of a sharp estimate for the Bergman kernel in this situation. 
and this was proved by Bloschke and uh, also by uh, Guan and Zhu. Uh, and here I will present, uh, without any details, a, uh, an alternative way to estimate Bergman kernels. Hopefully it could be also applied in more general situation, but that's far from clear. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, so the, nothing varies, but now we will make things vary. So we, we, we're going to deform the domain into something simpler. So uh, we just take a, uh, we have a fixed domain V, and uh, now I take some plurisubharmonic function in D with a logarithmic pole at the origin. So it's a sort of a Green's function. In, in the one complex case, it would be the green function of the domain. And I assume it's a negative. And then I take a parameter S that uh, is less than zero. And I look at the sub-level sets of the green's function uh, defined by S there. So the set where uh, the green's function is less than S. And I think of S as something very, very negative. So when S is very, very negative, you are very close to the pole. And, uh, and if the logarithmic singularity is nice, you have essentially a, a ball for, for very large negative S, S's, you have a, a ball essentially. So this gives you now a family of domains to which you can apply the theorem. And uh, uh, and you're gonna use this, so you're gonna have a good estimate for the Bergman kernel when S is, is uh, essentially equal to minus infinity, and then you're going to use the theorem to get an estimate uh, for s equal to zero, which is what you were really interested in. So you take the Bergman kernel for those domains ds, and uh, the conditions of the theorem are fulfilled, so it's, uh, it turns out that this is a convex, the logarithm of this is a convex function of s. Uh, and it's a, uh, since you have essentially a ball when S is very negative, it turns out it will be asymptotic to this, to minus N times S. It will essentially be linear. And then uh, it was observed by Lempert, Laszlo Lempert, that uh, if you add NS to this, it's, uh, well, it's still convex, and it's bounded when S goes to minus infinity. And that forces the function to be increasing. If you think of it, you have a convex function is bounded near minus infinity, defined on the negative half axis, and it's convex, it has to be increasing. So therefore you get uh, that the logarithm of B0, which is the logarithm of the Bergman kernel for D, is greater than the limit of this expression when S goes to minus infinity. But then you have, when S is close to minus infinity, you have essentially balls, and you know what the limit is. So this way one, one gets a proof for the Suita conjecture, uh, which I said was first shown by Bloschke and Wan Chu. So that's the last application of the method then, so you, when you introduce artificially some variation of the method. And now it's uh, my time to stop, I think. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> We have some time, some time for questions. Would anybody like to ask a question? Uh, is there any reason why the logarithmic version of Prokopa's theorem is essential for this generalization rather than the pecan cave version? of Borel's theorem. Well, the logarithmic version of Prekopa is more relevant to this yes. than the... Yes, it, it is that in this general situation, already starting with Prekopa, uh, uh, it, it's really necessary to have a logarithm uh, and, and not to the, the power one over n. Um, because with the power one over n, it would not be true. So, so if you take uh, Brun Minkowski, but you replace Lebesgue measure, say, by a Gaussian measure, you multiply by e to the minus c square, then uh, you, uh, the Prekopa still uh, applies and things work beautifully, but you don't have this uh, scaling properties of Lebesgue measure. So the one raised to the power one over n version does not hold, but the logarithmic version does hold. And it's even more true in the complex setting that it really has to be. 
Does that answer the question? <laughs> Do we have, uh, have other questions? Okay, then uh, let's thank the speaker again.